Town Hall here in El Cerrito. Um, just a few housekeeping items. The restrooms are through those double doors there. Uh, if you walk straight out, turn right immediately to the left. The restrooms will be there. We cannot have individuals standing in the aisles on the sides. Uh, we do have an overflow room that is out through those double doors, and a staff member will assist you getting to those. So if you're standing on the aisle side, if you could please move to the overflow spot uh, or uh, find an empty seat. Uh, if anybody has an empty chair next to them, would you please raise your hand? Okay. Uh, additionally, just a little bit of how the town hall is going to go. After uh, brief remarks, the congressman will go through a PowerPoint presentation. Directly after the PowerPoint, we will do a question and answer period. If we don't get to the questions, as there are a lot of you, um, we will be collecting those question cards that you've turned in. We will be answering them via mail or via email as we can. But we aren't able to do so unless you completely fill out the information that's on the top of the question card. Staff members are walking around. If you need an empty question card, please raise your hand and the staff member will come by and get that for you. That said, we have some individuals in the room that we'd like to recognize. Uh, we, first, we have Cheryl Suddit, the director of the West Contra Costa County Wastewater District here in the front row. Yeah. Terry Laura with the West Contra Costa Unified School District as the board member. We have Joe Carpenter, Senior Field Representative for Supervisor John Joel. Oh. And with that, I'd like to ask uh, the Mayor of El Cerrito, Michelle Pardu Okimoto. Thank you, everyone, and welcome tonight. Uh, welcome to beautiful Hardy Elementary, where both of my two sons attend. and. It's so great to see so many people from El Cerrito here and the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, I would like to do a couple of introductions very quickly. I have my fellow council member here, Janet Abelson. <laughs> and my fellow council member, Paul Fidelli. <laughs> and did any of the other council members sneak in while I was not no? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for coming tonight, and I won't keep it long-winded. I'll keep it nice and short. I wanted to introduce our wonderful, wonderful congressman. Uh, I know that every day we read the news, what's going on in Washington, what's going on in Washington. So it's really great to hear straight from our representative what is really going on and to be able to ask him questions. And I know he's out there really fighting for us, so let's give him a big, big round of applause.
to ask questions of Commerce Secretary, that was for real, um, <laughs> about why they put the citizenship question on this. Uh, it's never been asked in this way in the history of the country. One other time in the 50s, it was asked for full households. Um, so that will affect how we redo these maps. And for California, it's particularly important. If that question stays on, there's some analysis that says because it will repress uh, the, 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 how active people are in responding to the census questions, that we might lose one or two um, congressional seats and also affect our ability to reimburse. So um, this district is a great one that was done by the redistricting commission, which we started 10 years ago. Uh, every 10 years, these, these have to be adjusted for population changes. So um, it'll be interesting. Uh, the next time uh, this district, well, the, the next time uh, the district may be changed is in 2022. So to do the census in 2020, every 10 years. Okay. So this is the makeup of the Congress. Um, that was the old one. This is the new one. <laughs> see, um, this is very close, I and mean, we here in the Bay Area um, think of our perspective as different from a lot of places in the country, and um, it's, 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 no party is dominating, and a lot of that has, there's a variety of reasons for that, gerrymandering, um, what's called clustering uh, in urban areas where Democrats tend to live, we, we cluster, uh, and the rural areas are more spread out, and then there's the issues of gerrymandering. It was a good decision from the Supreme Court today on a 5-4 vote saying that the, the uh, districts that were redrawn in Virginia by a lower court will stay. Um, so, uh, I always say there are things elected shouldn't be involved with because we have an inherent conflict, uh, irrespective of, of your party affiliation or ideology, what we get compensated, um, how we fund our campaigns, and how our district is, district, districts are drawn. So these independent redistricting commissions are something that former President Obama, uh, former Attorney General Holder, are very active in trying to get more states to do what California has done and have an independent, um, bipartisan commission draw lines. Okay. So I'm on four committees. I am a masochist. Um, <laughs> and these are my two standing committees, and then I asked to wave on these two. I love oversight, Elijah Cummings, the wonderful chair from Baltimore. And then rules, and we have another wonderful chair of that committee, um, Jim McGovern, from Central Massachusetts, where I went to college. So um, I like to stay busy. I, I told the speaker when I first got there, well, and then the minority leader, uh, Nancy Pelosi, I said, just keep me busy or I won't cause trouble. <laughs> Which is partially true. <laughs> Thanks. Um, these are things we've been able to do. So there's actually an interesting article in the Post today about focus groups and polls that um, we in the Democratic Caucus have done. And a lot of these things that we have been able to accomplish in the House haven't gotten much attention. So we've actually been very busy and very active. This is an incredibly important bill by John Sarbanes, a good friend from um, Maryland. I was a co-author of this, worked with John, actually talked a couple times at Berkeley about this as he was writing up when we were in the minority. This will get to the problem of transparency and how campaigns are funded. Uh, it would require for any foreign money that's spent in this country that they would have to um, actually let you know who's paying for it. Likewise, for, and social media in particular, and also for, for donations um, from big corporations or special interests. This is something we did in California not too long ago, the Disclose Act here. Um, so if you get a nice thing in the mailbox that says it's a committee for children and cute dogs, uh, then they have to actually put through the, the corporations that funded it, the five largest, or if it's labor union, they have to fund that. So at least you know who's funding these things. There is many, many things in the HR1, um, but it's really important. It passed out of our house, uh, no Democrat voted against it, um, and Mitch McConnell said it was dead on arrival and it hasn't got a hearing, which is what's happened with all of these. So um, this is, this is we're, we're doing things, but be able to, um, do things with the Senate is, is different. Uh, that's some more that we've done. Uh, background checks for, for gun purchases closed the loophole on that. That polls over 80% of both Republicans and Democrats. Um, the Climate Action Now is just to say that we want to stay in the, pirate, uh, the Paris 
climate agreement, all of these things passed out largely the Democratic votes. These two are two that we're working on. Infrastructure is a problem, uh, having been involved in transportation for many years, uh, to try to identify funding. We have a $3 trillion shortfall in infrastructure. That's transportation and other infrastructure in this country. Um, and you can't fix that without spending money. So the gas tax, or the federal gas tax, hasn't been raised, uh, I don't think, since the 70s. I, mean, I forget the exact year. So trying to get Republicans to identify a funding source to go along with us that would pass the Senate is particularly difficult. And I've spent a good deal of time with some of my colleagues trying to figure out a way to do that, because it's really important. Uh, and the prescription drugs, you all know what that, how awful that is. I, some of you know this, I have a form of leukemia. Um, it's non-curable, but it's manageable. I have a, a pill I take every day that costs $500. Uh, fortunately, I have good health care, not because of Congress, but because I was a county employee and they gave great health care. Um, <laughs> health plan, which was the first federally recognized county HMO in the country, and it's, it's basically our public option. I went into it because I was the deciding vote to rebuild the hospital when I first got on the board of supervisors, and I wanted my kids and me to get the same health care that people went to that hospital. And we got terrific health care when we got in clinics. Um, but because of that, I am able to afford this unbelievable bill. This bill, $500 in the United States, costs less than $7 in Australia. So we have to, I'm glad to be alive, but on the other hand, um, we have to do things about this. We have to, and this polls, again, this is nonpartisan. Um, the, the pharmaceutical companies who are taking advantage of the lack of oversight for them is a real challenge for us. And this money doesn't go back into re re uh, research and development. I had an amendment to have the National Academy of Sciences, that hopefully we'll get out of the Senate, that would have them study what the benefit from private investments in prescription drugs and R&D gives us most, like my product, my pill, most of the research came from the Department of Defense. The gentleman now works at Ohio State, he retired from the military. So a lot of your prescriptions are done at the National Institutes for Health, so your taxpayer funding pays for that and somewhat in the Department of Defense. Okay. Um, this is just, we, we're going through appropriations. My chief of staff told me a couple hours ago, I fly back tomorrow on the 8 o'clock flight, and she said, you're going to be up until 11 or 12 in the morning because we just continue to have the appropriations bills and amendments go up. But because we have a majority and we have a great chair of the uh, Appropriations Health and Human Services Committee, Rosa Delora, which is a lot of this, that's what this is from Connecticut. We were able to get quite a bit in, um, into these bills. Good things. This is just to show that you can get things done, both in the majority and the minority, you find ways to work with other people. So you hear that we don't get anything done. Um, you can find things you agree to. Family engagement centers was on the previous one. Um, mental health for kids has been something I've been able to work with colleagues on the other side of the aisle to get uh, funded in. There, there are now 12 family engagement centers in the United States. I'm really proud of that. Before we got our bill passed a few years ago, there were zero. All the research shows that these can really be beneficial, particularly in low-performing schools where there's only one parent in the household or there's a lot of poverty. When you have these family engagement centers, they connect all the resources and make it easier for people who are very busy, particularly single parents, to get the resources they need. And we know the kids do much better when they get that. Um, okay, this is what we want to focus on. There's a few things in here uh, that we're going to go through quickly, particularly at the beginning. So this is a timeline. I'm not going to go through each thing. Again, if you want to look at this as we go along, or if you want to refer to it after, uh, then this page and the next just tells you all the key things that have happened, starting with back in 17, and of course, the president fired the director of the FBI. This is the timeline as it continues. Um, down to January of this year when Roger Stone, if you've ever watched the two documentaries on him, you wouldn't come away with really great feelings about him. So <laughs> is that fair to say? Thanks. And again, this is uh, just going through, there's a, a lot of things that have happened. And I think to some degree we just get overwhelmed with it. it's sort of like whack a mole with things happening all the time in this administration. Okay. So, these are the next few pages I want to focus on. Um, 
This is my hard copy of the Mueller report. I, I like that. I go through a lot of highlighters because I like to read. Um, it's, it's an incredible thing to read. It is very legalistic, uh, as you can imagine, from uh, an investigation. But if you can't read the whole thing, um, it's a little over 400 pages, and then with all the, all the footnotes and the attachments, it's 448. Read it, the summary and the conclusions. And it's only about 30 pages. And unfortunately, if the public realized, I think they would have different feelings about what he actually said and what it infers for um, the relationship between Congress and the administration. So this probably is the thing that I'm most concerned with. We're not ready. In my view, we've had no uh, um, oversight hearings in the oversight committee about what the Russians did and how effective they were with using social media and how ineffective social media was in stopping them. Um, and we're better than we were, but we're not where we should be. So this is, this is a fairly sophisticated and cheap way to affect democracy. But we also know they're very involved in Great Britain um, and in the European campaigns as well. So this is from a country with a leader who doesn't believe in democracy. And President Putin felt like when Gorbachev was there, the Soviet Union fell apart. He thought that was really bad. Um, unfortunately, we have people around the world, including in this country, that don't think that average people should be involved in governing. Um, I'm an American. I actually think it was a pretty good idea. Uh, it can get sloppy because we're humans and we have opinions sometimes and it can be difficult. But the end of it is better for everybody. And I always say when I walk into the House of Representatives, for me, it's walking into the same the same forum of human evolution. To aspire to be able for all of us to be able to have something to to join in to have a town hall and meet with your representative about how we gutter ourselves is to me the apex of human evolution. So it's worth fighting for and trying to make it as good as possible. So these quotes. These are the quotes taken right from the report. So uh, the, this one is the biggest one, just in a way that was sweeping and systematic. Uh, they reached at least 120 million Americans. So when we're finding out more and more, we've just found out recently that Twitter, uh, they reached many more people than we were originally thought. So, um, so it's basically, it's set up in, in two parts. One is the Russian influence, is the first, the first part. And the second part is obstruction of justice. So this, um, the, the special counsel puts a lot of work into. There's a Department of Justice opinion that you cannot indict a sitting president. Uh, it's not in the Constitution, and it needs to be challenged, in my view. Um, so, so this is what we're sort of stuck in, is the process that the founders gave us for a situation like this is to start impeachment proceedings, and that is glorious. Um, by, they set it up to make it difficult in the first place. Next. Uh, and if somebody says uh, it's a witch hunt, well, they caught 37 witches. <laughs> um, I would add 38 if you include the um, So th this, this um, his investigation, when you take the money that was taken, uh, recovered from Manafort that he had taken illegally, is actually not cost money. It's, a net. It's, it's added to the treasury. So when people say it was a waste of money, um, I, I would say it was wasn't the outcome I had hoped for, but the content is there. And clearly, um, in my reading of it, and reading and the people who have analyzed it is, he believes it's up to Congress, in my view of what he said, to deal with the obstruction of justice issues. And then it's up to all of us, including mm -hmm. Congress, to be prepared for foreign interference with social media and other things in the future. Thanks. So, um, I, I, can't, I can't do Colbert. Uh, in Colbert. So I just, these are things. Um, this is what the president says. This is what the investigation. Multiple acts by the president were capable of exerting undue influence over law enforcement investigations, including the Russian interference. These actions range from, so if you read all this, basically, and we'll get to the, the telling quote on the next slide, um, he's pointing away, in, in my view. Thanks. So this is 
this is the president efforts to influence the investigation were mostly unsuccessful, but that was largely because of persons who surrounded the president to plan to carry out the orders or to accede to his request. Next. And this is the end of the report. Um, he said this when he had his statement to the press. If we had confidence after a thorough investigation of the facts that the president clearly did not commit obstruction of justice, we would so state. So they didn't state. He, he's left this to the Congress to go through our process to decide whether he obstructed justice or not, in my opinion. So these are the congressional investigations. I'm sure we'll have questions about impeachment versus um, having these investigations. Next. Um, these are things that the Box Research Act um, that's something that I did. Uh, we know that the bots and the artificial um, people and so people things on social media expanded the reach um, exponentially. So we want to stop that. Um, we have met with social media companies, and on the oversight committee, we've had 20 investigations, seven requests for documents, and other information. It's very clear to me. I think and my colleagues on the committee in the majority that their game plan. Is it's just to, to, to give us nothing without a court telling them they give it to us. Uh, and then these are some of the hearings we've had. Uh, we have just, um, just in the last week, uh, held the Attorney General and the Commerce Secretary uh, in contempt of Congress, which helps facilitate us to get to the On the Census and on the Commerce Secretary, we have whistleblowers who have told us and given us emails that show that he asked the Department of Justice to ask the question on citizenship. So he lied to Congress. Um, and having having asked questions of him in public twice, it's very clear immediately he lied to Congress. And then we found out just recently that a political um, consultant for the Republicans was giving a direction. He passed away and his daughter found these emails and gave them to us. So. Uh, it's, I, you know what? All right, next. This is the Intelligence Committee. So, Judiciary would have jurisdiction, and that's what happened in Watergate. Um, the other ones who start the impeachment process, I had voted twice for impeachment. I
basically an indictment. So when I voted, I was on Fox News recently, and they, when they were asking about impeachment, and the interviewer actually asked good questions. He said, well, you voted for it, you supported it, would you vote for impeachment if it was on the floor? And he said, well, I, that's a hypothetical, because what I voted for was to start the process and have hearings. And then when it gets to the floor, after it gets voted out of the judiciary, that's a separate case. I'll be inclined to think I would because I support starting. Then once it gets out of the, out of the House with a supermajority, it has to go through the process in the Senate, and it's very, very hard, as you can see, um, to do. So this is just talking about what it requires. Um, any, any member can introduce um, a resolution to start it. Uh, there's actually a, a, a fourth one now, so those two and three I mentioned, um, that would just, uh, by Representative Tlaib from Michigan, um, who we refer to as potty mouth. Um, <laughs> her history. Actually, she refers to herself as potty mouth. Okay. Um, so this is the process. And this is what happens in the Senate. So you can see, again, how difficult it is um, to get this done. It's, the president's never been actually removed from office. Andrew Johnson came with one vote of being removed after the Civil War. So this is the current makeup of the Senate. Um, you can see it's not favorable to, to our, um, our legislative initiatives so far, except on those things that we can collaborate on, which are the, the ones you don't hear about and are not very controversial generally. Next. And this is where, so Senate is six years, House is every two years you have to run. So the makeup changes for the election cycle we just went through. Uh, if this map was up for the last election cycle, there would be more blue in here than red. We, the Democrats had to defend more states. This, the Republicans have to defend more states. So it will be hard. Uh, to have a change in that, and then you've got the filibuster rule with 60 votes. So, um, you know, people ask me all the time, why does Wyoming, with half the population of Contra Costa County, get two U.S. <laughs> senators, where a state with almost 40 million people get two U.S. senators? And it's because um, that's how the Constitution got ratified, and we still live with this, and we have to amend it if we want to change that or the electoral college. There is an initiative uh, that is. There's some doubt about the constitutionality of it. I voted for it when I was in the legislature. It's just popular vote. So if you get enough states representing a majority of the population, the theory is that would change. Each state would have to give its votes based on popular vote, which means the popular vote had to win the presidency. And you, you wouldn't have the electoral college for me. It, so it would be President Clinton now instead of the president we had. I want to take a point that they're, they're, they're getting within striking distance. Um, this is a, uh, a group of people who just go state by state. California did it quite a while ago. Um, okay, so next. So this is something I'm really proud of. Uh, the, the Congressional Management Foundation is a, not a bipartisan nonprofit back in D.C. Uh, they give awards to members um, and we were a finalist last year for constituent services because of that. That lady, you know, when she did that for her. And we were runner up. Um, I, I'm a graceful loser, so I just threw things and kick, kick cans and stuff. And then um, we were just a few weeks ago, actually this week, I had to go to the dinner and receive this. So we, we with a, a Republican member of the Senate, at this award. So one Democrat, one Republican. Okay. Yeah. Ryan, it's a miracle. I got that on the yes. yeah. yes. So I'm sorry to run that run through so quickly, but we want you want to have as much time for questions here as possible. And um, Ryan is the Caesar Colbert of our town hall. Space, and he also does all our veteran services. Uh, Thank you. Former Marine. Uh, <laughs> even the Navy veterans are on side of that. Hello again. Just as a reminder, if you have any question cards that are filled out, please raise them in the air. A staff member will come by and grab them. Uh, if you would, okay. Uh, we've got some question cards here. Uh, someone's coming by to grab those right now. If you have uh, a question.
question from the slide that you'd like to ask, we have blank question cards that we can give you as well. We will try and get through as many question cards as possible. If we don't get to your question card, please fill out the talk uh, here and we will respond to them via email or mail. Additionally, uh, we will be able to re-watch this on a Congressman's Facebook Live page and it's streaming. Uh, anybody coming in, please, uh, as a reminder, please don't stand on the sides in the walkway. So we do have an overflow room. If you ask a staff member, they'll walk you over there and uh, you'll be able to hear everything that the Congressman's saying over there. We'll have question cards for you there as well. Um, additionally, one last thing, um, some of the question cards, I did have a, a mark to read, uh, read your own question. Due to the high volume of individuals, I won't be able to get to you, uh, just for the sake of going as quickly as possible, I'll be reading all of the questions as well. Our first question is from Libby. I would like to thank you for the work that you do. Could you explain what the difference between an impeachment inquiry and the impeachment process is? And why is Nancy Pelosi so reluctant to begin an impeachment inquiry? So one of the things about doing this PowerPoint is and doing the questions the way we do it is some, sometimes we more or less answer the question in the PowerPoint. Um, I think we did that in part. Why does the speaker um, believe that not doing impeachment is, is the right strategy? Um, well, she's concerned about what happened when the Republicans overplayed their hand, in my opinion, when they impeached Bill Clinton. Um, and what happened after that was the American public gave us the majority because they thought that was ridiculous. Um, so there's that. Um, and if, if you went back to that map, if you remember that map at the beginning of the makeup of, of the House of Representatives, if you look at the 30, 35, what we call frontline members, um, I think 20 of them are from districts that Donald Trump won. I usually don't say that name. Um, all the, the districts that Baltimore won. Um, <laughs> When I did that, I did that some time ago when my staff was like, don't say that in public and I like, this is um, so there's a challenge there when and I've said this over and over again, so forgive me if you've heard this. When uh, my predecessor George Miller, who's a dear friend and was for 40 years a remarkable representative for us, um, he told me before I went back, he said, Mark, you're gonna have to get used to the fact that your colleagues aren't like people from California, particularly in early California. So I called him and I said, what's well, fairly paid for that? And he said, okay, smart guy, you call me when you figure that out. And I joked him a week after I was back there. So these districts are very different. You know, if, if certainly if they were reflective of Bay Area districts, um, I think the situation would be different. The speaker is very, very, very good at having votes. And that's the legislative leadership. She had many talents, but she's good at that and maintaining the votes. So the last thing we want to do is lose our majority because one of the one of the things that's holding this country together, in my view right now, is this is our ability to have hearings and let the public see what's happening. Absent that, the public will be able to see anything. <laughs> and so I think that's that's why um, I think, and then the polling numbers. But I think. Having lived through Watergate, um, and there are times, the timing is everything, as Shakespeare quoted about when when you pitch, when you catch the crest of a tide. Um, so, but the way to do that, in my view, is to let the American public see, knowing that this is different from Watergate. I was in a, a, a lunch of our delegation, the, uh, the California delegation, uh, Democrats some months ago, and I said, Geez, where are the Howard Bakers of the Republican Party? Where are the Pete McCloskeys? And Anna asked you, God bless her, from, this, from the peninsula, looked at me and said, Mark, you don't, they don't exist anymore. And that's, I don't think that's entirely true, but uh, it's very different. And trying to have these hearings in a way that the American public, including in those tough districts, uh, where they have a different view of the country and the world, those are the people we have to convince. Um, so that's why she's doing what she's doing. Um, I respectfully, I understand that. Um, I think we should start the proceedings because I think it, once we get this information, the public will see. Now the other thing is timing. We probably won't get some of these people who were fighting for us, we're, we're going through the courts to come and get testified um, until October, November of this year, just as a legal process. 
So that's what they're doing. They're running the clock out. So our ability to get people in. So in either way, it's going to be difficult. In some way, it will be good um, because the country will be able to see this play out as we go into the next election. Uh, the sooner we do it, the better, in my view, but um, it's just going to be hard. Sorry, that was a good question. Our next question is from Diane. Is there nothing that can be done to get around Mitch McConnell's blocking of everything from the House? Uh, yeah, he's up for election. <laughs> uh, and he has uh, just read an article in the last two weeks. He's got the worst polling numbers of uh, anybody in the country. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is I asked my colleagues from Kentucky if he's vulnerable, he said, well, some of that's because his voters in Kentucky thinks he isn't with President Trump often enough. So this, but this is illustrative of how different this country is right now. In some ways, I tell people the House is sort of reflective of the country. The country is very divided right now between rural communities, uh, Kidley communities in the South and the rest of that, um, and urban communities. And there's a variety of sociological and economic reasons for that. Um, I think we've left people behind. Uh, areas been, you know, we've been leaving people behind for a long time, urban areas, people of color who've been stuck in poverty because of the endemic racism in this country. But we've left other people behind too, and, and we can't do that. This economy has left too many people behind. If you've got investments, it's not a bad economy. The more investments you have, the better you're doing. If you live on wages, you're not getting ahead. And that's where I think we Democrats have to do a much better job. I uh, was on there somewhere. I let a group of members go across the country in the future and work wages and labor. We went to different, we started in Berkeley at the Labor Institute there. We went and talked to the researchers. We continued conversation with them at town halls in Wisconsin, Michigan, New Jersey, Massachusetts. We met with experts there, um, UCLA. And it, when you look at what's happened since World War II, about how the whole of the middle class and the inequality we have right now, that's the problem we have when we get past Trump and the Republicans being ideological. And that's the one that I think um, Elizabeth Warren actually was dressing very well. Uh, there's a book that she wrote with her daughter called The Time Come Trap 25 years ago. She knows her stuff. She knows from a, from a researcher's perspective what's happened in this country and what we have to change in terms of quality and opportunity. Our kids don't have the kind of opportunity we have for people in my generation, the baby boom generation, the housing costs, um, the, the ability to make enough in wages so that you can buy a house and keep moving up. Um, we've got to fix that in this country because it's, if you don't have opportunity in American democracy, then you're going to have this divide. Our next question is from Wendy. What additional powers does an impeachment process have that regular committee investigations do not have? Can an impeachment committee force the president to turn over various types of information? So this, this is one of the reasons why Jerry Mandler, the, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, has become more, um, more supportive of starting an impeachment process. Jerry is an attorney. Uh, we're getting plenty of advice from legal scholars and our attorneys say if you start the impeachment process, the courts would have to respond more quickly. Um, and then we would get more response from the administration that's instructing us from getting that information. So that's a, that's that's the inferred legal device um, that we're reading about and getting is if you start it, the courts would have to respond more quickly. Having said that, we've won three uh, important decisions um, in the last three weeks in the courts. We met with our uh, legal counsel a week ago. And um, he was saying that they are they understand the urgency and they're being more responsive than we thought that would be. Our next question is from Kathleen. Many of us, including House Dems, are privileged enough that the fascist administration isn't impacting our impacting us like others. But people are that are lost are losing and will lose their lives because of these policies and actions. Impeachment is not a luxury item, but an intellectual exercise. One would not leave Hitler in office. Why would we wait? Why wait until that hindsight? Yes. Yeah, I, I would. I would agree with that. And, and if you don't think you're being affected, you are. Um, I recommend Michael Lewis's 
book, The Fifth Risk, where he talks about what's happening, and that was, he wrote that a year and a half ago, so just about the hollowing up of the civil service system, the morale problems. Um, I've talked to people who are in Region 9. Region 9 is um, much of the West Coast federal headquarters. Their offices of all the departments are in San Francisco. The EPA is on Hawthorne Lane. They've encouraged people to leave, particularly from this region because we're progressive, uh, leave the EPA and then sign a document that we think is illegal because it's coercive saying they wouldn't return to the EPA for 10 years. So, so this, this is happening, you know, you read about this stuff, but this, the, the, in my view, the poison is endemic throughout the system and it's causing real morale problems. Um, young people don't want to go work for the federal government. Uh, and this is, is the consequences of, of this election. So we just have to stick with it. Our next question is from Heidi. Thank you for speaking out publicly about the need for an impeachment inquiry. Please co-sponsor uh, HRES257. I don't understand why you're coming out in favor of impeachment, but not co-sponsoring 257. I think 257 um, is Representative Tlaib's um, uh, impeachment uh, bill, and I've talked to her. I mostly it's just, to be honest, dealing with the committee chairs, trying to make sure that um, I don't irritate people who I want to work with. <laughs> so some of this is speaking your mind and some of it is, is respecting people who you respect who are committee chairs. Um, and so uh, I would be in line to think in the next few weeks I will be a co-author of that bill. But we're going through a process to do that. Just, in, just the other three I've all been a co-sponsor of. And as I said before, I was the 14th member of the Senate. Our next question is from Judith. Are you as alarmed as many citizens are by Trump's frequent allusions to the idea that he might not be willing to leave office when he is voted out in 2020? Isn't this anti-democratic behavior reason alone to impeach him? What is Congress able or willing to do in advance of this threat to our elections? Well, I'm sure you saw that he, in an interview last week, said that uh, the American public is so enamored with him that he might insist in saying that for eight years. And, you know, I know he's not conversant with the U.S. Constitution, but the 22nd Amendment says you have to leave. Um, and I think he's going to leave before that. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, folks, you know, this is just where one of those times I, I like a, you know, the Jack Kennedy inaugural speech where it was so inspiring when he said, Few generations are asked to defend freedom at its ultimate moments of peril. And he was talking about the Cold War. We're in a similar situation right now. And we just have to fight like hell and keep fighting and get through this. And then hopefully a year and a half, as we're walking through the airport, uh, Congressman Nashu and I were talking about this, and I said, well, we've made it through two and a half years with all the awfulness. We've got a year and a half to go. If we, if we can remove them sooner than that, great. But if not, we have to make a change. And this isn't about, I have these discussions with my Republican friends. It's not about conservative or liberal, I really. This is about um, adhering to the rule of law. This country has had a long debate about individual rights versus the social contract. That's part of our history. I always tell a story I love to tell about when you walk into Monticello, when Jefferson first opened that, and if the DOSA is doing the job, if you go there, it is home. There are four bus uh, above the above the door um, as you go in, and sometimes they're Hamilton and Jefferson are down below. Um, and somebody asked him, "So why do you have a bus to Hamilton facing you?" And he said, he, "The person said you don't agree with him on anything." And Jefferson said, "That's why." So this is the debate we're supposed to have, but we're not supposed to have somebody who doesn't understand. And he took an oath that Lincoln called an oath made in heaven in front of God. He was making an oath to the Constitution of the United States. The guy doesn't even know the 22nd Amendment. I mean, so he, in my view, he doesn't think rules apply. We have a real problem in this country, in our culture, in politics and business, in my view, where you're a sap if you're ethical and honest. And this is something that's happened since World War II. We just for all the good things that have happened about identifying sexism and racism and 
um, homophobia, the things that we, we should be proud of that we have started to address in this country, we still have this weird, I mean, you can see it in his, the way he carries himself. He thinks that, in my view, that if you are ethical and, and work within the rule of law, that you're somebody to take advantage of. And this is something, in my view, endemic in our business culture right now. So if the people who have somebody who owned businesses for 35 years, I want everybody who's competing against me to play by the same rules. And if not, it just goes down like this. So that's that's part of the problem right now in this country, is re-establishing an ethical culture that we had post-World War II. That I, I, I,
Please have to ask, we can talk about that afterwards. I am um, on the board of directors of the Progressive Caucus. Uh, Marco Cam is one of my closest friends from Wisconsin. He and I started our future work, Wages and Labor, um, uh, co chair. Um, Congresswoman Paul um, is also a close friend, so I will ask that question about what the test is to get a progressive caucus. We have a very big progressive caucus right now, um, and I think that's a good thing. My next question is from Charles. Can we trust the courts to enforce the subpoenas from the House? No, we can't. I mean, courts are political human institutions. Um, if you go back, one of my heroes that nobody knows about is Charles Evans Hughes. Uh, I have a, quite a picture of him in my office with his signature. Uh, he investigated Teddy Roosevelt. Um, he was the governor of New York. He was secretary of state. He was an assistant justice. He left the Supreme Court to run against Woodrow Wilson as a liberal Republican. And he was supposed to win it, and he lost because Wilson won the South. Um, he was part of when FDR tried to pack the court. Historians like to say that was a mistake by FDR. I think it worked because the court changed. There's an expression that says, and the justice who changed, ironically, his name was Roberts, um, same as the current Chief Justice. And the, the expression was when he switched his opinion, and this, these were opinions that said you couldn't have child labor laws, but that was against the Constitution. You couldn't have eight hour, 10 hour day laws. It was against the Constitution. So FDR was frustrated not being able to get his, the New Deal passed. And then when he tried to pack the court, this is my opinion as an amateur historian, very amateur, the, the Supreme Court switched. So Justice Roberts in that time switched from a 5-4 majority to a 5-4 majority to support much of, much of the New Deals. And Charles Evans Hughes was the Chief Justice at the time. And then we were able to get all these wonderful things done that now we take for granted. Not having children work in, in, in manufacturing and have their limbs um, removed from them. So I, they, you have to remember that the courts are, um, at their best, they're objective, but they're, they're political institutions. I would recommend another book for you, How um, Corporations Get Their Citizenship, Citizens' Rights. Uh, it just talks about how, and this is again my view, the, the, um, Republican administrations, with the help of the Cook brothers, have been picking uh, very active conservative judges, the Federal Society, and you're seeing the handiwork now. So why don't we have the monopolies we have? Why don't we have the buildup um, that are in violation of the Sherman antitrust laws? Because the courts have redefined what a monopoly is based on how they affect the consumers. So that's why we have these huge, they have changed it, Congress hasn't changed the, the laws. So this is part of being um, aware of what's happening. So this is where the public is important. I mean, you, you, we have to be engaged all the time. And we have to be engaged in a way right now more than we normally have to because of the, the trial we're under right now. So you, you hope for the best. I mean, the, the decision today on Virginia was a good decision, um, but it was five to four. So the next two weeks are going to be important because the court's got a deadline to, to make decisions on Census. My next question is from people. How will you stop Donald Trump from starting the war with Iran? Exactly. <laughs> and NSU has a bill that I'm a co-author of that would prohibit from him from doing that without getting a resolution from the Congress. Barbara Lee has a bill which she introduces every session, God bless her. Um, Week, I sat next to Barbara and right ahead, right in front of Jackie Spear, and I said, Boy, I'm in the arms of powerful women. <laughs> Jackie started pushing my chair, and she goes, How are you going to like this for the next six hours? <laughs> Barbara saved me. Um, so, Barbara has this uh, authorization war act um, that after 9 11, the Congress gave the president uh, much more authority to go and do military actions because. The enemy was so difficult to get after, uh, and we've left that in place too long. So Barbara's, Barbara's bill would rescind that and say it's back, time to go back to what the Constitution said. You can't go to war without coming to the Congress and letting the public see what the debate's about. So I think that's really important. We have to wait for
Oh, yeah, well, there's that. So the question was, what about the money to pay for more? Um, the people don't, the, 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 the tax cut that they just did is an example of fiscal irresponsibility by the Republican Party. We trillion dollars to our debt. Um, we actually did pay go during the Clinton administration. Congressman Miller was an author of that bill. So this is what we leave to our children. And then there's the cost of the military. Um, we will have a vote on the defense appropriations next week or the week after. I have never voted for it um, because there is enormous waste in the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense has, is the only department that's never had a complete audit and they're basically fighting us over that right now. We have an independent group that started during the administration. Uh, it's a business advisory commission, committee that looks at the, at the Department of Defense's budget. It did had McKinsey go in and look at their budget, and they identified $125 billion worth of waste in this department. Um, and then the Pentagon tried to make sure it didn't get public, and somebody was eating to the Washington Post. So we had hearings about it. So they're going through their audit right now, but because um, the cost of war, and there's moral authority, um, which just hurts us over and over again. Um, so yeah, there's all those things, but we've got to be really careful, and we're going to be on him, um, and people like Barbara Lee and Jackie Spear and Anna Hesh, who all Bay Area members and myself, are amongst the most proactive at this, is trying to make sure that the public knows that this, this administration is being completely reckless when it comes to uh, its diplomatic relations and the potential use of American military force. Our next question is from Helen. Do you think that Barr should be impeached? <laughs> yes. Yes, they're only 10%, but they're really important. If you read through where they are, um, it makes you really question what those ongoing investigations are. So this is just give it to the Intelligence Committee or give it to the Congress is what I would say. There is a secure room in the basement of the, of the Capitol where when you go in and if, it's, if these are classified documents, you have to sign an affidavit, you have to leave your phone there, you can't take notes. We should at least be able to see those documents as if, as if they're classified. Our next question is from Beverly. Please tell me what you're doing to address federal mortgage interest deduction. The $10,000 limit is low for home ownership, home ownership in high property areas. Yeah, so we, we, need to, we need to change this. This was diabolical when the, the, tax, um, the tax reform was passed, such as it was. And if you look at where it was impactful, our district was the 23rd most negatively impacted. It was all urban areas with high housing costs. So in this district, almost 50% of the almost 800,000 people who live in Contra Costa in the district I represent took the state and local tax deductions and the mortgage deduction. Almost an equal amount of people took the education deduction. So each of those were worth about $20,000 worth of potential deductions depending on where you were in your taxes. So we have to fix this. When you get out into the red parts of the, of the country, um, because they don't have state and local taxes like we have here, um, it's just the opposite. So it was very, 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 very partisan and meant to deliver pain to urban areas. Um, and so, and then it impacts local government. So if you want to pass a bond or pass a sales tax or pass a parcel tax for your for the library or for extra police or anything else, um, it's going to be hard to pass that because we as taxpayers are going to say, well, I don't want to, you know, I can't write that off now. So it's, it's, we have to change it. Um, I'm not aware of a bill right now, but I'm going to go back and if somebody isn't doing it, I'm going to do it. Uh, because we need to at least put it out of the house and say we need to change that. Our next question is from Mark. I'm a proud member of Jewish Voice for Peace, which champions progressive causes both domestically and internationally. We want to urge you to support Representative McCollum's HR 2407 regarding Palestinian children under Israeli military detention. Also to defend Representatives Omar and Tlaib, who are being unjustly accused of anti-Semitism for supporting Palestinian equal rights. Yes. Uh, 
Prior to them, I served with um, Representative Omar, um, is on the Education Labor Committee with me, and Representative Tlaib is on the Oversight Committee with me. What they did, the Representative Tlaib, on the comments that she made, and it took them completely out of context, was absolutely unbelievably awful. Um, it, it, this is part of what's happening here, is there are people who are playing into blatant racism. Uh, for political benefit. That's what the zero tolerance thing was at the, at the board. I went down there with um, a group of uh, members, all women. They were funny. It was the women's members uh, for immigration reform. They told me they needed one up all the so they invited me to go along with it. But when I went down there two weeks after the administration decided to do this, it was the most upsetting thing was he did it deliberately to, to, fit, to divide Americans and make it about race. Um, it wasn't about what was actually happening there and what continues to happen there, which we need to address. We need to get more judges down there, we need to process more people through for the asylum, and then we have to be down in the countries, uh, in the three countries where, that are, people don't want to live there for obvious reasons. They, they risk their lives, their kids' lives, so we should be down there giving the kind of financial support and help to restore the rule of law so people can live in peace and don't have to travel 2,500 miles and pay $25,000 to be insulted when they come here and, and apply for what is their legal right to ask for asylum. Monopolies 
or I won't be able to stay in the office. This is what I'm being told. This is, I want to go to a different, I want to find a socially a responsible company, a um, platform that I could communicate with you on. They don't exist. So we have to break them up. I mean, I, I'm one of the first people who came up and said it's time to break up Facebook, uh, Google, and Facebook. <laughs> The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Yeah. Yes, terrific work that will keep you awake at night. It's a Harvard professor, and she's terrific. She just goes through how they have taken this. You know, I was just talking to, I have this um, project I'm working on with a group of members to restore local journalism. And one of the questions for the AD reporter was, how can the Bay Area have this monopoly owning all the newspapers except for the Chronicle? All your newspapers, the whole Contra Costa Times, the whole Tribune, the San Jose Record News, the Marina IJ are all owned by a privately held venture capital firm in, in New York, all the financial. They've ripped out all the journalism. Well, we need to restore that. And I understand that the print model is gone forever, but the digital model can survive if you have people who are good reporters telling you the truth. So this is part of the social media problem. We just had a hearing, the chair of the um, Oversight Subcommittee on um, National Defense, Stephen Lynch from Boston, I gave him that book to read, and he read it over a weekend, and they said, well, we're going to have a hearing. So we had uh, somebody from Google, um, Facebook, and, and um, Twitter, along with the Secretary of State from Massachusetts, to talk about all of this stuff. And when it came my turn, I said, you know, I'm the only person on this panel who's from the Bay Area. I used to be really proud of you, and I'm sick of it by you now. Your legacy isn't going to be the good things you gave the world. Your legacy is going to be that you under undermine American democracy. And this is the problem.
to study how we transition. So in this county, we have four refineries, four of the 13 refineries left in the state of California. They're very big job creators. We've taught with them for years. They now hire local hires. Um, SB 54 is a bill that Long Hancock carried when I was in the legislature that co-authored, requiring them to only hire state apprenticeship approved uh, employees for their contract. But we have to get ready in this county. This county should be an example of how do we transition or we'll end up like West Virginia. I had this argument with a Republican um, on the Paris support um, bill that came through the Rules Committee and they were talking about if you do what you're saying you're going to do and then they say it's a hoax, which is bizarre, um, then you're going to ruin the economy. This economy, the fossil fuel economy, is going to change. And if the Chinese do what we think they're going to do and mass produce an attractive $25,000 battery electric car, which they're working on because they have to, they don't have access to fossil fuels. 80% of their energy fuels come through the Strait of Hormuz. So they are very aware of this. The American car companies have been slow to this, but the General Motors just said, we're going to switch and start to really load up on this. Volvo has said they're only going to sell battery electric cars. And this is important because this is where the biggest contributors to climate change from fossil fuel is in our whole fleet. So we have to we have to act as as the question said in the next ten years to very dramatically change this. And the biggest challenge of that is our cars and our trucks. Um, we have to transform that fleet, but we can't leave people behind. So what I said to the Republican from Texas is he was going through because they're such a fossil fuel dependent state. He was teasing me about Austin, and I said, you're going to be lucky you have Austin, because it's this little island of tech. I said, because when these cars start coming, you're going to make West Virginia look like a small problem, because everybody's going to be left behind. So we should be doing that here in the Bay Area, and I want to talk to John about that, is start spending money on how do we close these refineries.
if a vaccination is protecting other people, you have to consider that. Um, and yes, we need
We have the highest cost as a percentage of GDP. We're about 18%. The Japanese are second. They're about 10%. Um, the French and the, and the British are down about 8%. So, and they have better health outcomes as measured by the World Health Organization. They have. So, we pay more and get less. Why would you defend the system if you have that? And the Affordable Care Act was an act of compromise. It took a lot of work. Um, and it's improving what the legislature and the governor is doing in this state to get more people to get good quality health care is really encouraging. There's a story in the New York Times today about how uh, California is basically implementing a universal health care program, slowly but surely. So, um, I, I, as somebody who has received health care, one of the things we definitely should do, and I'm co-author of this, is have the public option. So, if you have the public option, at least as the next step, then people would be, then they'd have to compete against the Contra Costa Health Plan. Kaiser, um, Health Net, they all compete against the Contra Costa Health Plan. Well, it, it has a very small universe of people, but it's a viable option. And I, I don't think I'd be standing here if it wasn't for the Contra Costa Health Plan. So, get a public option. And when people talk about the cost, I mean, we already did this in the Affordable Care Act. The cost for change a fifth of the economy is, is something you have to consider because you're changing a fifth of the economy. But over the long haul, it will cost less and you'll have better outcomes. So you have to, this is just like the conversation on climate change. You have to work on, you have to have the goal and you have to work on the transition. So those people who do work for insurance companies now, if we're going to, there are going to be fewer of them, you have to figure out how to not leave them behind and make sure that they can have a transition. And I think we're doing that in California. It's not unbelievable what this administration is trying to do with the Affordable Care Act. For pre-existing conditions, for, it's, it's just unbelievable. And in those states that didn't take the federal funds, those conservative states, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. They, they, were, they could have increased Medicare and Medicaid, Medicaid in particular, Medicaid in particular, for poorer people. But in those states, in those poorer states, they didn't do it. They said, no, we don't want anything to do with this. That's, the, that's where the problems are. In a state like California that took the money, we've been able to do a really good job of getting more health care for people, getting millions of people health care who didn't have health care before the Affordable Care Act. But ultimately, we should have the best health care system in the world, which would mean moving to a universal single better health care system. Right, we have time for a few more questions. As a reminder, if you have any question cards that are filled out that haven't been turned in, please raise them in the air and a staff member will come and get that for you. Uh, we did have a large number of questions this evening, and I understand that we did not get to all of them. Any questions? Of course we did, Ryan. It's West County. <laughs> Any, any questions that we did not get to, uh, we will respond to via mail or email as long as we have your full information on the question card. Additionally, you'll be able to rewatch this town hall on the Congressman's Facebook page. Our next question, uh, David and Virginia, you both have very similar questions. Uh, what are Democrats doing to ensure that the coming election is not tampered with? And how do we combat disinformation campaigns and foreign interference to protect voting rights? We're not doing enough. Um, we want to put a billion, over, over a billion dollars into it. I think we put like 350 million into it. When you read the Mueller report, it says the Russians favor Republicans. It says that in the document. Um, I don't want to be elected by Republicans. I want to be elected by you. I mean, they can vote for me. I'm happy to have Republicans. As a former Republican, I, and we do, but I don't want Russians electing American electives. That, that should just be the number one thing, right? We, we, people died for this, for your ability to vote. So I don't, we've got to put more into it. It's a constant admonition I make. Um, our, our Elijah Cummings, our wonderful uh, chair from Baltimore, the Oversight Committee, has been terrific on this. Um, he, when Elijah starts to preach, he, he, he gets to the point where he says, we're better than this. But he says it in a tone that's different than I can communicate. <laughs> and he's right. We're better than this, so we should expect more from our government. We have to be prepared that they're going to do this again. And you can't get all wound up about what you see on social media because they don't care about you. Next question is from Linda. 
How does the NRA have such a stranglehold on Congress that there is no effective legislation regarding any reasonable gun control, especially on assault rifles? So the bill we passed out just on background checks was the first gun control bill. I can't remember that long, but in a long period of time. I don't understand it. Um, a good book for you is The Gunning of America. It just talks about the history about the, the American um, gun makers were largely marketing people. And it became this culture of how do we market to people and how do we get in all of the ways. Um, I don't understand it. I have a bill that I try to do in the legislature that I've tried, I'm trying to do here that just would treat it as a public health issue. It's we have wearing charts that show the public health uh, where we've acted on public health, so gun violence is an outlier in this. And I don't know why they have as much control. You can see, though, that there is, is from what is happening now, um, the corruption within the NRA, the alleged corruption, that they're sort of rotting out. Um, and I hope that will continue. Um, if people who want to own guns under the protection of the Second Amendment as defined by the Constitution and the courts, and they can do that, but gun violence is something that we should be treated as a public health issue. In California, it, in the states that have been more aggressive, in California, Connecticut, our gun violence rates are noticeably less than the states that don't do it. So there's plenty of evidence that it, this could be a discussion. What people do, in my view, on the right, the NRA is, is the premier example of this. When you try to discuss something, they start yelling, screaming, so that you can't get to the point to have a discussion, have a discussion. Um, and that's been their monitor for some period of time. It's just screaming and taking away our guns. Like, no, we want to have a discussion about the fact that we don't want a country where kids can't go to school and worry about somebody coming in and shooting. I mean, that's not the country we want, so let's have a discussion about what, what policies we can do to make that change. This is our last question. Uh, this question is from Chris. How about having a resolution to censor Barr, Trump, McConnell, and other culpable people in addition to impeachment or if no impeachment proceedings occur? Yeah, we could do that. The censure is just a statement. So it doesn't, it might help with the courts, it might help with the judge. So we could do that. There are bills to that effect, I believe, and I will um, make sure I'm on that. So I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, uh,